Welcome to Cinema 5D on the couch here from the B&H booth. Thanks to our partners B&H, G Technology and Rode Microphone, we are happy to welcome another round of guests. This time we are talking about virtual reality. VR is the buzzword of NAB 2016. I know nothing about it, and which is why I invited a range of um, technology experts uh, from different companies who work with VR cameras. So we have Kim from Nokia. Hello. Uh, we have George from Sf Sphericam. Sphericam, Sphericam, yes. And we have uh, Kevin, Kevin <laughs> sorry, from Kodak. <laughs> Welcome. Hello, everybody. Maybe uh, each one of you can do a very brief introduction about yourself, your role in your companies, and the technology you guys have been working on. Because I think the VR uh, world is still in its infancy, uh, and um, there's still a lot of very, very different approaches to how to tackle uh, the problem and how to actually achieve uh, spheric or 360-degree images. Uh, Kim. Hello. So, yeah, I'm Kim Granholm. I'm the lead engineer of the Ozo application team. I've been working um, on the Ozo project uh, since the start. And I'm responsible for the team that's delivering the applications that come with the Ozo product. So the Ozo has a big uh, appearance here at the show with a separate stage outside of the uh, central hall. Um, uh, you guys have been very busy promoting uh, this, uh, uh, why, how did Nokia get into making 360 degree or spherical cameras? I mean, we all know Nokia still as a mobile phone company. Uh, Nokia actually is not a mobile phone company. Because, Anymore? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that business was sold to Microsoft. But uh, Nokia, the majority of Nokia is actually doing networks. Um, what we work for Nokia Technologies, which is kind of like the advanced technology group of Nokia. And we have quite strong knowledge background of cameras from the mobile phones time, so we have matching skill set there. And we started looking for different areas that um, we think are big trends in the future. And this was one of the projects that I started early on and, and therefore became the first product that we launched. Cool. So George, what is Sphericam all up to? Sphericam is a 360 degree camera. Wow, that's a surprise. Uh, we've got six lenses and six sensors and are completely mobile and streaming as well. Um, I'm with Media Relations for Sphericam. I'm kind of new to the company, but I've been working with Jeff for a long time on uh, ideas for this. And it's been a very interesting progression to this point. Great. Kevin. Kodak, we have known as a film company. Yeah. Um, you guys have been pioneering actually digital photography uh, without a lot of people knowing. I think the first digital camera was a Kodak camera, if I'm not mistaken. No, yeah, that's very true. So what are you up to in terms of virtual reality? Um, so I'm the marketing specialist for Kodak PixPro. And we just got into the VR space. We started maybe two, three years ago. And we had the yellow camera, which was a 2K camera. Um, and our main focus is really ease of use and accessibility. Um, you know, it's been very challenging to sort of learn and create 360 content. And so we're trying to sort of get the ease of use um, for everybody. Um, so we include, you know, you know two lens system, one stitch line, a remote control trigger so that you can, you know, get going on the fly and shoot drag drop system and you're up to Facebook, YouTube and any other platform. So the Pix Pro is more of a consumer approach, whereas Nokia is more tackling the high end for and, and you guys are probably is it also consumer? Yeah, we're in the middle somewhere. In the we're middle. actually a pro um, a pro level product with consumer level features or a prosumer feature. Okay. Right in the middle of these two. So where do you all of you see current applications for VR? Uh, because I think a lot of people who haven't experienced it don't know what it's like. It's very hard to, you know, convey to our audience what it's like if they have never tried it with uh, goggles on their head or, you know, something like that. But where do you see the most applications and most customers using virtual reality right now? Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I really see from my interaction with working with everybody is that there's literally limitless applications for it. I feel like anything that you do with video or photography completely applies into the VR space. Cool. So give us an example for what, what are your current clients, you know, what are they doing with the PixPro? 
Yeah, we get a lot of a lot of real estate people wanting to do virtual tours of properties, a lot of travel and tourism, getting to exotic locations and being able to share that 3D experience with everyone. Um, even in contracting, construction, medical, like literally, I people's creativity for VR is it astounds me still. Cool. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with Kevin. Um, I also think that the, the possibilities there are like endless. Um, we like to think it as like a time or space machine that basically transports you in different time where you couldn't be uh, in the past or in different space that you physically just can't travel. It's, it's like teleportation. Um, that's, that's what that VR presence actually can enable you to do. And as you said, the applications that are currently done with video, almost virtually every one of those can leverage VR, be it entertainment or education or this real estate use case that you just mentioned. I think that the possibilities are, are endless. We think that the possibilities are endless as well. I mean, that's a general consensus in the 360 market. Um, our particular device is designed to do a lot of different things for production. So one of the reasons we're right in between is because we do want that consumer feel where you can come in and just pick it up and use it so that anybody can take their creative idea to 360. And we want that professional feel like the Ozo has um, that you need a real professional production crew to put something together. So we have both options built into here. We feel that the first use of 360 going forward is going to be streaming. We had YouTube opening up free streaming, Facebook's coming out with their free streaming um, on it as well. And because of the post-production problems with 360 and the difficulty and length it takes to do it, we feel that the streaming factor is going to take off first. People care a little bit less about what it looks like and how perfect it is when it's live. And we can do a 100 megabit stream at 4K out of this camera. And we've been running that for almost three days in the booth over there with no overheating and no problems of that nature. And that's why we feel that this is going to be a really good product for us is because we've got some of the problems resolved that stop people from doing live and immediate things with it. News is going to be using these. A lot of things that where you see a person and a camera all the time, this always shows the person using the camera. So naturally, that will be the first uses of it. And live is probably going to be the first because of the post-production problems. But my first question, where do you actually I mean, how do you hold it so you're not in the shot? <laughs> Can you do that? <laughs> There's something called a parallax curve. When you're shooting a spherical with so many lenses, there's areas between the lenses that fall into what we call the stitch. Now, that area between ours is 40 centimeters. So if you're closer to 40 centimeters to this, and in between the lenses where we have our tripod mounts, we have eight of them, uh, you're within the parallax curve. We actually have eight-inch long legs that screw into this. So we can roll it on the ground or throw it, and you can't see the legs at all, but it keeps it from hitting the ground and, and you know, fracturing the glasses or something, and the lenses and things like that. Um, it, it's just something that's easier to do, and it still gives that 360 wow factor, and that perspective that you've never seen. Uh, drones did this three to four years ago. They gave us perspectives that we'd never looked at before from a point of view that we hadn't seen before, and it was very exciting. And it used to be a real big project, like it is now, to do a 360, just to do a drone f uh, flight and do a film. Why is now the time for VR? Why, is so, why are so many companies coming out with product? Is it, is it only now that the technology is on the, at a stage where real-time stitching is possible? Or Definitely. Um, I, think three, I think VR and 360 video goes 30 years back. Um, and yeah, in my and quick time VR, I remember in the <laughs> 90s was... Yeah, you know. no, it's always, it's always been pushing its way forward. And thanks to technology, we've been able to condense it and condense it. And now we can experience VR on our cell phone, right? So, so yes, now is the time. Technology finally caught up to th VR and 360 video. Yeah. So I assume uh, software is probably a big part of what you guys have to be developing. Because, I mean, I see it's basically normal lenses that have a specific wide angle, I guess, and uh, there needs to be, you know, the software or the intelligent behind it to, to actually stitch it together. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's definitely one challenging part. But on the hardware side, there's also challenges to fit those lenses so close to each other, um, make it a nice package, integrate the whole device, and do it in a way that you can handle the thermals, for example. How do you, I mean, I'm a more traditional cinematographer, filmmaker, um, but it's, you know, th there's, there's been a lot of questions about VR. I mean, there's a lot of clients interested in shooting VR. I know you, you all come more from the technology side, uh, but, but how do you think it will change how a film shoot, for example, is approached? I mean, where does the co whole crew hide, definitely, for example? Definitely going to change that. I was speaking to a couple of people who are doing a 360 full movie production right now. They're hiding things behind trees. They're putting generators stacked on top of each other so they can get them right angle so they get away from the view of it. Um, there's a whole new perception of what we're going to have to do as filmmakers to make this work or content creators. Um, in a 2D format, you don't get to use a new special feature, which we get to use now. It's called peripheral vision. When you look at things, you see very clearly what's in front of you, but you don't see clearly what's on the side. And one of the biggest problems with production right now for 360 is how do we control our viewer, where they look, and what they're focused on without letting them know that they're being controlled, with them thinking that they're making the decision to look over there. That's very important. And with peripheral vision, we can do that in 360 in the goggles, just like you would in real life, and walk up beside somebody and make them look over, just by uh, imposing on them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one very popular application of actually viewing VR right now is, um, for example, Oculus Rift or the, the cardboard glasses that Google has, um, which uses the hardware and software in the phone and all the processing power in the phone to actually track head movement. Is that correct? So that is one way of experiencing uh, VR by turning your head and actually the scenery turning with it. Of course, we now have YouTube and Facebook as well uh, actually giving you the ability to move around. But of course, this is not as immersive. But where do you see VR in the future? For me, this is just the first step. You know, when I think about virtual reality, I think about the Star Trek holodeck. I want to touch things. I want to walk up to things. I want to, you know, create a whole environment. Where are we with regards to technology? You know, like how far away is that? Well, I think the headsets these days are already good enough to give you quite a nice immersion. I, I think it's, it's ready to be viewed. There is room for improvement, and I'm sure that's going to come. Uh, one thing is, also, of course, that consumers will have their whole, own headsets, but there are other places as well where those uh, VR glasses will appear. Uh, I know some, th some places where they've been using those to build like virtual theme parks, basically. Um, then we will see if there comes like VR cafes or VR cinemas where you can basically, basically go to VR uh, view VR. You think it's a technology that is more isolating people? Because I know a few weeks ago, or I think it was at CES, where Mark Zuckerberg walked up on the stage <laughs> with everybody wearing, no, I think it was at IFA in, in Berlin, yeah. everybody wearing VR goggles and nobody noticed a billionaire walking by them, going up on stage because they were so immersed. Well, is, that, is that a worrying trend? <laughs> I don't think it is because, yeah. I mean, think about when we started doing social media and computers, everybody said, well, you're going to be locked in your room and you're never going to come out and we're never going to interact again. Now we interact more online, more worldwide, with more people than we ever did before. There's no way you can personally interact, except for a show like this in the booth, <laughs> with as many people as we do every day if we didn't have the technology that we use. And actually, technologies like this open up more sharing and creativeness because what you saw in your goggles, you know you only saw it and nobody else did. So now you have to communicate that or share it with them in some way. So it actually, I think it actually kicks you in the butt and makes you want to share more. Okay. Good point. Definitely. And then, and then the same way that I can communicate with someone across the globe, we'll be able to do the same thing in the VR space. So then me and him could be talking. He'll be in Finland and I'll be in California. And, you know, we're more connected in, the, in that immersive sense. And so, yeah, totally. It, um, the same with social media. Like you said, everyone says, oh, no, everyone's just on their phones nowadays. But we still communicate. We still talk. We still have friends. Nothing's really changed, you know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean... Uh, 
I can't imagine everybody walking around with goggles here, but uh, <laughs> we'll see more people. I, I wonder when I see the first person on a on, uh, subway wearing those. Uh, so well, we'll what see. if you have goggles that also have cameras in them? So now you can see the real world and you're augmenting it inside the goggles. So in the future, it's also going to be very contextual, you know, understanding you, your normal routine and stuff. Let's say you're in San Francisco walking down the street at dinner time. Okay, you're walking in your goggles, you have glasses, you can see your know, cameras so you can see what you're doing. Your goggles know that it's your dinner time. So all the restaurants start popping up menus at you. Yeah. So you don't have to think about it, it just starts happening. It starts giving you more information when you need it uh, and at the right point and where you need it to so help you. So like Google Glasses was like maybe the first step in that direction. Exactly, yeah. it's some way of communicating with a um, uh, technology that can understand contextual data and be able to communicate that to you without having you have to interact with it. And uh, retinal projection, that type of thing, is, is probably the most uh, uh, subtle way of doing yeah. that. And, and just to add to that, there's always a time and place for everything, right? So, you know, yeah, right now people are really just consuming entertainment through VR. And yeah. so, and so you, you wouldn't be walking around with your headset on necessarily. It would be, it'd be for your own time when you do have time. Well, I still remember a time when people <laughs> were offended when somebody would, you know, have a phone call in the street. Yeah. That was like mid-90s when, <laughs> like yeah. when cell phones were coming up. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, times are changing. Um, let's talk about m a little bit more in detail about each different camera from you guys. I mean, uh, I know it's a relatively small community, so you're probably aware of the other products that are out there. In how far, where are the differences between the different, uh, different solutions you guys are offering? Well, I, I guess I'll start off um, just highlighting that we're just a two lens solution and it, o and it offers one stitch line which when you work with, with this kind of technology, those are very sweet sounding words. Two, two lenses, one stitch line, very beautiful. And, and it's at a 4K resolution, which is exactly where it needs to be. How do you, I mean, only two lenses, but you still have 360 degrees? Yeah, um, each, each, each uh, lens covers a, half a hemisphere, 235 lenses, and so there's overlap. And then that, also, that overlap also allows you to play with your distances in the stitch line which sometimes when you cross the stitch line and your distance isn't adjusted right, that's where you'll get those funny, uh, you know, inconsistencies. Okay. But, um, I mean, this means this is a super, super, super wide angle. Yeah. Um, doesn't everything that is here, isn't that, like, super, I don't know, interpolated or something? Well, it's all software, right? Yeah. And so when you look at the raw file, you're going to see like a fisheye effect, but once you turn it into a 360 file using our software, now all of a sudden everything's in the proper perspective. Are there standards for finishing formats in VR already? I mean, what, what can I upload to YouTube or Facebook to actually show up as a 360 degree video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, the, we, all, we all obey the same rules for a 360 video and they're pretty standard. Um, I, I guess the, when the, for me, the difference would be um, in the metadata, right? And so when you process your files through our footage, um, you'll, our software embeds this metadata, and once you put that through Premiere and re-render it, it's gone. So then it wouldn't read as a 360. So then as long as you put it back in, your files will be read properly. So Premiere now also can edit 360 Yes, degree. yes, yes, they just updated that maybe a few days ago, right? Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm very excited about that. That means that that, that, that's probably the biggest thing holding us back is the everyone working with each other to help us grow. Yeah. And so seeing Adobe uh, give us these little updates, it's just a great sign for our, our future. Absolutely. What about the Sphericam? Sphericam is that mid-range where we've got a lot more stitches to deal with than he's talking about. And um, we tried to address all the pain points of 360 VR. 360 VR production right now, for the most part, is a pretty painful thing. Um, most of the rigs that are built are just that, built before every shoot with chips and batteries and mounting everything together. Um, and then you've got the problem of starting all the cameras at the same time, orienting the array so that your stitches are where you want them, and starting everything. 
uh, we've gotten that down to basically a one button push where we push a button it orients the camera and starts recording at the same time keeps that orientation so you can use any orientation you want to with it um, a lot of the other pain points are in the post-production side where you're pulling out chips you're trying to figure out which sensor it went to which shoot it was you've got a lot of data there so you probably don't want to go through a cable well we thought about that. We have a USB-C cable in ours, so you can pull it out at 300 meg and not have to worry about the chips, but there's always professionals who want to do their own post. So we've put in a six chip, chip uh, slot that we can actually pull the rack out one move, take all the chips out. We have a unified file system, and we're building it sort of like a RAID array for your chips so that when you go in there, you're not looking at six cameras anymore. You're looking at one file system, and you can pull down what you want, and we have uh, indications of what camera sensor it came from, which button push or which shoot you were on, and allows you to work much easier with any software afterwards. Um, the other pain points for most of these things are internal during the shooting. You've got battery power you've got to deal with, the amount of time the batteries last versus the amount of time that your chips fill up. And at 60 frames per second, we fill up at 60 minutes, our batteries last 60 minutes. We have rechargeable batteries, but they're also removable and rechargeable batteries. And since you can get the chips out with the cable or by pulling the chip slots out, you can re-rack this and be back on set in five minutes. Or you can plug it in, have it recharge, and take down your files. We're trying to offer more flexibility for the production professional uh, that wants to do it that way. But with our pre-stitched 30 frame output, okay, which is done inside the camera, we pre-stitch it at 30 frames and make it so that anybody can pick up the thing and use it. We have software afterwards that will help you stitch the unstitched ones, but the pre-stitched, you don't have to worry about that. You're coming out with a compliant video file that you could use in goggles and you could use on the web, and we also stream that at 100 megabits at the same time as we record it. So we've got a lot of options for that mid-range uh, professional and prosumer to um, get the job done any way they want to do it, not the way that we determine that they have to do it. Um, some of the other problems are that people don't understand what to do with 360, as we talked about the crew, the director, stuff like that. So we're putting an app together so that we can communicate with the camera, control it, and have a director's preview in a remote location. Um, so I think we're trying to cover all of the bases that you would want for something in that mid-range mm. uh, scenario. Um, I think that uh, all the companies that are coming out now are trying to fix these pain points more than anything else because the genre of 360, just like drones in the last few years, kind of relies on making this a tool instead of a project. Uh, once we release creativity, for the people who are not as techy as all of us seem to be in the 360 world right now, then we're going to bring in those uber creative people who can take this creativity to another level. Um, and it's required to, to move a genre like this forward that quickly that we make tools instead of projects. Yeah. What about Nokia? The Nokia Ozo, I think, is certainly the highest end uh, solution among those three but also much more expensive. Where is your target audience and, and, and what, what do you think are the most applications that you uh, will have for this device? Yeah, so Nokia also is, as you said, in a little bit like different category. So it's targeted uh, totally to industry professionals. Um, it's stereoscopic, so it has um, eight, eight lenses, each 195 degree field of view, um, eight 2K by 2K sensors. So when we run our stitcher, the output resolution is UHD per eye. So you get UHD panorama for left eye and UHD panorama for right eye. It still has standalone operation with battery and, and SSD disk. And it has single cable output uh, that can be used, for example, as we are demonstrating here in NAB, to provide a live stream. So there, in our booth, we actually have a live stream of stereoscopic um, VR with full 360 audio included. Okay, great. Um, are all your products currently available, or are they, is your... No. This one is not currently available. It's ordered for pre-sale. Yeah. Uh, we start mass production in June, July, and expect to start delivering in the early fall. Mm -hmm. This one looks pretty final. final. Yeah, yeah, this one's <laughs> ready. It's been shipping since January. Um, it goes for $8.99. It includes all the accessories, the stitching software, and the two units. 
So it's a fantastic price point, and they're ready now at CodecFixPro.com. Yeah, and the Ozo has been shipping, you said? Yeah, it's been zip shipping since March in North America, and now it's uh, shipping also in Europe. Okay. Yeah. And our, our price point is $2,500. Okay, cool. So one more question. Um, the When I think about VR, you know, like the more immersive it gets, the more we... I just mentioned it before, the more you want to also you know, interact with your uh, environment. How do you feel people, um, you, you, but you're still you're pretty static. I mean, it's like you, you put the camera somewhere. Of course, you can move the camera, but how do audiences react to a moving camera in a, well, you know, they can turn their heads, but they cannot actually walk and go through the scene. One of our demonstration videos in the booth is actually quite moving. It's um, on top of a car. Uh, a long pole in the back seat, driving down the road, uh, going under bridges and uh, through things. It's, it's rather unique looking and it's uh, a rather pleasant feeling if it's a smooth and you know, motion sense that you get out of it. Now, if you take the camera and do like that, you're not going to have very good viewers. They're not going to feel very good afterwards. So you could, do, you could do a lot of damage with this stuff to people, couldn't you? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think acceleration is one like big uh, reason of nausea. As you said, if you have a steady movement, that's basically how you would feel if you were in a car, mm -hmm. because your balance sensory tells your brain the same information that your eyes can see. But once you start acceleration, slowing down, or any kind of g-force, your eyes tell different information than what you can feel in your balance sensor. And it's very subjective. Some people are more tolerant and some people are more sensitive. But we have moved the camera and in, in some of our productions, if you do it peacefully, like calmly, um, it's usually actually quite nice experience. Because while you move the camera, at the same time you get this parallax effect. If there are close objects uh, and background, you can basically, it, it somehow like even emphasizes the stereoscopy and the 3D-ness yeah, of, of the experience. Um, but you have to do it in quite calm fashion, not to, not to make people sick. So for example, mounting on a crane and then moving around a little bit. Uh, this is the stuff we've been trying and I think it works, it works quite nice. Yeah, yeah um, I, I actually really like to think of our, our VR cam as a more of an action VR cam. So I personally encourage and enjoy a lot of action and movement. Um, I've, taken, I've taken this camera wake surfing on the selfie stick and you're literally in the water surfing and you see the whole environment. Because of the one stitch line, the parallax issue isn't a big deal because I can get as close as I want to the front and the back of the lens and so on and so forth. I also like the idea of the POV point of view where like I'm, I have it, this is, you can separate the two cameras and so I've mounted it to the front of my head and the back of my head and then I go walking and I go adventuring and now if you put on your Oculus, right, you, you're the person moving and, and adventuring your environment. So you could take them apart and you would still stitch? Yeah, and they still stitch together. We're oh, wow. also mounting these on drones, um, pulling them apart and mounting it. So we remove the drone completely from the scene and it feels like you're flying through an environment. And so, yeah, definitely um, I'd like to look at ours as more of an action-capable VR cam. But I assume, I mean, just thinking about it, the horizon always needs to be correct, right? Because if you put on goggles yeah, yeah, yeah. and so you would sit there and suddenly you know, the world does this. So, yeah, what totally. Happens? Um, it's like a roller coaster ride. <laughs> so, yeah, I've yeah, actually... But on a roller coaster, I still have a sense of gravity. Yeah, yeah. So the way he was saying about the tolerance, you might get someone who actually tips over <laughs> on their chair, but at the same time, you can also have someone who just, like, just understands that they're not actually moving, <laughs> and so they just roll with it, you know what I mean? Interesting, yeah. And so, yeah, the tolerance is a big issue, but for those who like that action, definitely you can accomplish it with us. Okay. And I think the rule for motion with these things is slow and smooth. Um, just like you would for uh, you know, a person who's driving around a car or something like that, uh, the jerkier the movements and stuff, the, the worse it's going to be for them. All right. <laughs> I also think that people tend to build some sort of tolerance, like who are more experienced with VR, they can basically uh, they can just somehow understand what it is and they, have, they are more, much more tolerant to these sort of things. And I think it's, it's the same thing than with roller coaster. I mean, like if we take people that are a few generations uh, behind uh, in the roller coasters, you know, they would not understand that what's the entertainment there. <laughs> if you take your kids there, 
Um, they're they, they love just it. love it. They, they yeah. just ask if, if it could go any faster. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess there is also some kind of learning curve there. Yeah. Well, I'm sure also with uh, the Ozo, I think it's the only stereoscopic camera out of these three. Uh -huh. it, you also, that means you see three-dimensional. Um, the immersiveness is even higher, and I guess the tolerance needs to be higher if something goes wrong or moves too fast, because it, it's, it's maybe, I don't know, closer to reality. Um, I guess the answer is yes and no. I mean, it's closer to reality, so you pretty much feel like you are there uh, in a little bit even stronger feeling of presence. But at the same time, you are not, um, like I said, you are not providing kind of wrong information to your brain that much. I think all these nauseating effects, eventually they boil down to providing some information to your brain that is impossible in real world. It's because of our technology. And, and those are problems. And when it comes to stereo, sometimes that also makes it a little bit more comfortable to watch in a way because it's, it's more real. But then again, like you said, if you start you know, shaking, shaking the experience around, I think that uh, that will make it uh, feel also more real, which means more bad. <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah, it's about transferring the presence and trying to do it so that um, it's, it's, it's coming to your brain as it it would if you were there. Yeah, I think once you have recreated the reality perfectly, you can start experimenting with stretching reality, right? And, and challenging people. <laughs> immersion is a very, very strange animal to play with, which is great because uh, you know, it can make people sick, it can make people happy, it can make you experience something a little bit better. But it also has that ability to do things like reduce pain sensitivity. Um, immersion can be helpful for physical therapy, PTSD. There's so many uses for this in medical community and in the business community that a lot of what we're talking about here, action films and playing around and stuff, is going to be quite meaningless down the road. Um, this is a business device. Enterprise is using 360 and VR and AR and they're building it out now. They know it's 10 years out before it's fully done, but they'll get benefits from it every year along the way. And I think you're going to find that you'll see a lot of like live streaming, like we said, and a lot of the consumer level type stuff with a few really big productions using really high level equipment like the Ozo. And uh, down the line, it's going to start turning into more of a business thing behind the scenes. Uh, you'll start going to look for you know, a new car by sitting in virtual goggles rather than sitting in a, in a showroom. Uh, you could do all this stuff from home with the goggles and be in their showroom. So you start to see the business aspects of it, of not having to go places like we don't like to go do things and do them from home. Now that's probably the best case scenario for virtual reality in the business world and monetarily. And groups like you know, the Ozo with the very high level stuff are very required right now. And the low level, very, very required to have something simple, two camera, one stitch, simple for a consumer to try and use. Because how else are they going to get the ideas that they need to come and use the Ozo or one of our devices? You know, this is a lot more difficult with six stitch marks in there. And uh, the Ozo as well. You know, you've got some complications that people don't think about when they go to an amusement park and film their family. And they don't need to. Okay, but you're doing like a small commercial or light production and you want really high quality stuff, then you're going to go up to a better level and, and do it with a little bit more pain and you're going to get a better production out of it. And if you want and you've got the money to go up to the very high level and get the best production values, then you're going to go with the groups that are at the very head of the list right now. So we all have different demographics, we all have different uh, groups that we're selling to, but there's one common thread amongst them all, and that's production value and ease of use for the level of person that's actually getting into it. Great, I think that was a great closing remark. Yeah. Uh, that <laughs> kind of sums it up and gives us a hint of the future. I think this is, yeah, we just see the tip of the iceberg of where this technology is going to go. And um, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm also <laughs> looking forward to actually testing your cameras because we are a camera review site. So I would be very happy to, you know, uh, have a look at them and, and, you know, go creative with them. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for being here, guys. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to our audience for watching. Thanks to our sponsors, B&H, G Technology and Rode Microphones. And uh, tune in for another show of On the Couch. Thanks for watching.
Thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.